and uh, just this is what I look like. <laughs> I forgot that I did myself. <laughs> Uh, and so for those of you who are just tuning in um, to the Unmaking Network and my research for the first time, before I introduce our wonderful guest this evening, Nava Messes Waxman, I'm just going to share with you um, what the Unmaking Network is, is all about. So unmaking, as written here, with a slash between its prefix and its root, is to be considered an adaptive and generative method that uptakes slow, gentle, collaborative, and timely acts of deconstruction or dismantling in order to create something else of value or use. Also making reference to the UN, United Nations, and their 17 Global Goals for Sustainability, and working to expand the definition of unmaking and co-build an unmaking dictionary so that the word becomes synonymous with repair, restore, resist, refrain, refuse, relinquish, and reimagine. These interviews are helping this network to develop this unmaking dictionary and an unmaking methodology that will promote images, ideas, and words that help to imagine and bring forward ecological aesthetics and equitable biodiverse futurities. All right, so now for our special guest, Ms. Nava. Um, so I, just as a brief, before we briefly introduce her amazing <laughs> history as an artist, um, I thought I would just let you know that uh, I first, I first met, um, I met Nava and experienced her work at one of the major Toronto art fairs. Uh, where we were both producing large two-dimensional works for sale, um, stunning compositions, gorgeous materiality in her large encaustic works, and uh, was immediately impressed by her work, but then was also really uh, moved to see how her work uh, transitioned over the years and, and through her MFA work and now into her PhD work. So who is Nava? other than a, a wonderful mother to Ellie, <laughs> who's here with us tonight. So Nava Massa Waxman is a Canadian interdisciplinary artist whose practice engages identity, memory, liminality, and notions of the body as an archive. Currently living in Toronto and a creative research fellow at the Laboratory for Artistic Intelligence, Massa Waxman received her MFA in visual arts from York University and her BA in Social Science and Communication from the Open University of Israel. Now commencing a PhD in the Visual Arts Department of York University, Nava was awarded the Joseph Armand Bombardier Scholarship from the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada. In addition, she received an exhibition assistance grant from the Ontario Arts Council in 2018 and a travel grant from the Canada Council for the Arts for her collaborative project, Elements of Chance, in 2016. Some of Nava's recent projects also include Shared View, commissioned by Artworks Toronto, Variations on Broken Lines at the Gales Gallery in York University, and Choreographed Marks, the Varley Art Gallery in Markham. Being born into a Moroccan Judeo Amazigh immigrant family has shaped her interest in themes of movement, migration, time, and space, while del delving into the transitory nature of gestures often embedded within complex artistic, cultural, and personal registers. As an artist and researcher, Neva works at the intersections of choreography, performance, moving images, drawing, and installation to explore understandings of embodiment, technology, materiality, and me mediation. Interested in choreographic and archival methods, Neva maintains an ongoing investigation into gestures, and her practice-based research has focused on notions of liminality, the psychological process of transitioning across boundaries and borders, and how it influences the construction of identity and in turn the one's creative practice and performance archive. In addition, she explores the interrelations between performative gesture and its documentation in, or inscription. Currently interested in the role of digital media technologies in generating embodied experiences of, live, of liveness and presence and how embodied interactive technologies generate expressions of movement, affect, and transformative experience. Neva is investigating the temporal tension between the virtual and the real, 
corporeal and technological. So thank you so much, Nava, for doing this interview with the Unmaking Network. So I'm going to uh, share a screen where I have my questions as well as amazing images by Neva. And I was wondering if you could start by telling us Okay, from beginning, here we go. A little bit of context um, about how you transitioned or pivoted from a, sort of a commercial um, art practice. <coughs> um, all the sort of why reasons, you know, why, when, how. Um, can you provide us with sort of the, what, how, what was the key factors that pivoted your practice away from the uh, producing of consumable objects? So first of all, thank you so much, Jill, for inviting me and for giving me this opportunity to talk about this particular body of work um, that I'm uh, interested to um, respond to your questions and research. But I will we'll start by, first of all, acknowledging where I'm coming from right now. I'm in the process of becoming and practicing language acknowledgement. And I'm currently joining you from Markham, which is uh, the traditional territories of many groups and many indigenous groups, namely the Huron-Wendat, the Haudenosaunee, and the Anishinaabe. And it's also um, the land of, um, the land is also covered by Treaty 13 and the William Treaties. Um, and I'm very happy to be here. Um, and um, okay, so I, I also wanted to say that I sent you images and I was kind of was, was, I was interested to think of the way you would kind of reorganize them in relation to the questions. Um, it started, everything started quite 10 years ago, almost a decade ago. Um, and um, it was, roughly around 2013. Um, until then, I was mostly working with painting. I was working with the medium of encaustic, um, working with a different kind of um, methods of collage and encaustic, uh, working with beeswax and found objects. And I was mostly working with painting. And I think back in 2013, I started, um, a performative research um, experimental process so that um, uh, continued uh, for almost seven years. Um, and this is this particular period of time in which involved with the um, simultaneous processes of transitioning and uh, both from the perspective of identity, where I'm coming from, what I've been going through the, as a human being, but also within my practice uh, within the materials that I've been working with um, and with uh, methodologies that I've been working, surfaces, gestures, um, archive. Um, so yeah, it, it, was, it started back then um, where I started to, it was a very particular time in my life. I was uh, working with galleries and selling my work in the art community, in the art world the way you're describing it uh, but it was really a, a very a challenging time of my life I was a young mother um, I was an immigrant and um, I I also uh, dealt with with the second with the birth of my second child I dealt with the a postpartum depression that was also later on seemed to look like more kind of a um, post-traumatic stress disorder. And it was really a difficult, difficult time for me. Uh, I felt uh, that I'm kind of in a, in a space of kind of isolation. And, um, so, and it's really also affected the way I was working and painting. Uh, and I think that was kind of the breaking point, the, the, the trigger. There's all these um, experiences that I've been going through in my life. Uh, back then, I also, I just, I was, as I mentioned, I was immigrant. I mean, when it comes to community or being, feeling like I belong somewhere, it was really, really, really 
a difficult and challenging time. However, I kept working and I kept coming to the studio and kept practicing. But that is where I slowly started to kind of deviate from painting, not from painting, painting. Painting has always been there and it's actually also happening today, but in a different way, maybe conceptually, but um, um, I was deviating well, from what we think about painting in terms of artifact. I, I was no longer was able to paint the way I was painting. And that was, that was the moment where things started to, and I'm going to talk about it more. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think you mentioned that you got to a point where you were very successfully being collected, but then your galleries and collectors were telling you what they wanted versus, I think you had mentioned that it became very prescriptive for you. Yeah, now you're talking about this, when you're talking about capitalism, you're talking about the arts world. And I think that was, that was um, uh, the first uh, response that I was experiencing in relation to this change. Mm -hmm. you know, that I am dealing with issues within my world and, and I am a, at the same time um, working and painting other people's painting in a way. Mm -hmm. and, okay. um, and it was a combination of uh, not able to paint because I am in the process of figuring out and healing, but mm -hmm. also slowly as a result of not painting, the world in, in a way kind of evaporated around. Mm -hmm. So that also invoked this kind of a frustration of really understanding what, what is happening and if I paint, what it means when I paint. Mm -hmm. um, but as I mentioned, I continue working with painting and I continue practicing with painting, but it just in a different way. And we mm -hmm. will talk about it. What you see here on the left is, um, my early paintings and on the right is um yeah it is it is an image from the studio back in 2013 it was just at that time where i'm it's a transitional time in which i'm slowly testing the possibility of migrating my painting or my gestures into different surfaces so i'm starting to i start to paint on my wall and document the wall um, and, uh, and you can still see in this image, uh, both, um, tangible surfaces of, of painting, but also, um, body, my body gesture, uh, being captured with a digital, digital mm -hmm. camera and traces of, of, of paint, painted gestures on the wall. So it's, it's just the transition. Right. So for those of you who aren't sure what we're looking at, there's a sort of a, in the um, middle right of the, of the right pen picture, there is a sort of a very blurry um, figure there with, looks like you're wearing blue jeans and a black t-shirt in that while you were doing that work. So that's actually Neva, uh, a still of that, Neva creating those gestures, right? I'm um, at that back then, um, started to document my process in the studio mm -hmm. and so the camera was always there. The digital camera was always there. Mm. And I think it was kind of a way for me to deal with the disappearance of my work when I mm. knew that um, I haven't, don't have any more objects or artifacts. Mm. Yeah. Um, I began documenting and that also lead that's that that the, the decisions I made back then documenting really became kind of a scaffolding uh, that holds everything that I continue to do later on with mm -hmm. art. Yeah I like that because I often feel that the process is where the art happens and so you know to me archiving that um and sharing that is is really important. Okay so let's move on to your second question. When you made the shift from artist commodity, was there anything you had to unmake about yourself and the way you thought about art and your role as an artist? 
So yeah, I kind of shared a little bit in the, your previous question. That's where everything's starting. So when we think about unmaking, we're thinking about construction of identity, going through processes of unmaking the self, trying to figure out how to negotiate um, different parts of my identity, where I'm coming from, but identity, also the identity of my work, but I also identity of who I am. And um, so it, everything, all the changes within my practice and uh, the reconstruction of materials and artifact or reconstructing methods of painting, everything sprouted, came from um, of, of a process of, um, of negotiating or reconstructing identity. So, um, yeah. Yeah, it's, um, I think we also had a brief discussion about, you know, what we, when we're unmaking ourselves, what we leave behind and, and how difficult we, we, you know, we're not just leaving behind a way of working, we're leaving behind a community of people that supported that way of working and how that can be um, extremely lonely and scary. Yeah, so I think you mentioned that. Okay, um, so this is, uh, I'm just going to move this up so people can see. This is a. Yeah, so um, how can I explain this image? You know, this is again the studio wall, and um, we are going to, we're going to show, see later on a, a moving image that I created. Uh, about four minutes that really emphasize this idea of uh, surface uh, land um, and uh, the idea of notion of palimpsest as well. So that my studio wall became the main surface in which I was um, using for painting, uh, temporary paintings that became some kind of a backdrop um, to my studio performances and uh, also uh, a way for me to kind of test or experiment with the idea of migration of gestures, how the painted gestures are kind of mig migrating, displaced or dislocated from their space into different places, such as the lens of the camera. And, uh, and there's objects in space. And again, I'm always there with the camera. I was really, really interested in um, in the in the in the digital camera, uh, not only as a tool to record um, the process, but also um, to play with ideas of light and and shutter and. Um, but we will talk about it more late. Late. Mm -hmm. uh, I know I didn't have this question or series of questions, but I noticed that there's ready mates uh, or objects brought into these works. I'm just wondering, like, is that marble and um, and looks like fabric. I'm just wondering if when you're bringing in those objects um, that might have, do they have their own narrative that you're trying to incorporate in there? I think at this point, I already went through a long journey of kind of figure, figuring out and really under, understanding what I'm doing with painting and uh, I am more kind of settled with this idea of letting go of the tangible object. Um, and so these just random objects that um, in the studio and there's, they, they, I, even though I, over time, I embodied these objects in, in a conceptual way and I think of them as a object that means something to me. Mm. Not necessarily, I was thinking, first of all, every, these images I um, never been done in order to show to anyone. It was not even at that stage of showing. It was completely mm -hmm. experimental process. And I really want, I was interested in that contrast between movement and stillness, between, um, between something that just happened in such a nonchalantic way, such as things that in space, like that kind of, um, things that are kind of rooted in the existential field of being. But at the same time, you see that the, the, the body is kind of a transcending or um, there's, mm. there's such movement uh, within the gesture 
uh, of the body. So I was interested in that contrast in between. So I was playing a lot with object in space. And in, in a way, I think about at this point, I was already conceiving the frame of the camera lens as a painting. So all the painting sensibilities that I carried with me over the years, in a way has been translated in, in, into, the, into this practice. So there's a composition and space and uh, stillness and movement and, mm. and uh, negative space. Um, and I was just already thinking about it from, from through the lens. And yeah. that's why you see all these kind of a um, interesting composition of of, uh, of different kind of gestures, painted gestures, body gestures. But at the same time, there's something that is really holding us uh, or kind of anchoring us um, through the yeah. object. Yeah, the marble does well. Is that marble or is that wax? It's actually salt. It's it's oh, salt. Salt, Himalayan salt, yeah. Salt of the earth. Interesting. Yeah, there's a, I love that sort of contrast between sort of these stable, solid masses of material and the ephemerality of our of the human body there. All right. Um, okay. So our next question. Um, and you know, I'm asking these questions because. Ultimately, I'm going through some of the transitions and changes that you've already gone through. And it's, so if we acknowledge as visual artists that we contribute to or perpetuate sort of the capitalist, industrial, patriarchal, and colonial perspectives and gestures towards land, and that we're, at, you know, as practice, practicing artists, we're, you know, in the, in the commercial world, we're constantly being asked to consume and produce, and then, of course, can't help but discard. How do you see your practice in relation to the concept of unmaking some of those sort of material realities? How, like, how have you, how has this shift helped to sort of slow or disrupt the harm that, um, um, yeah, that ultimately artists are a part of, right? Um, again, I wanted to, to say that I'm, um, I will talk about it from my from a personal perspective and how I can think about it from this particular um, work. But also, I feel like this question can be uh, is contained so much together. So, for example, we were talking about capitalist industrial. This is, as I mentioned, uh, what I've been talking about. Uh, the, um, you know, the kind of detached from the art world back then in 2013. Um, but I really think, you know, it's how can we, in what way we can um, think about the connection of artifact or paint or artwork in relation to colonialism and in relation to uh, gestures toward land, by the way, like the word gesture, I'm also gonna talk about it. Uh, so I wanted to separate these two and I wanted to, first say that when it comes to capitalism, uh, you know, uh, it, or, or about selling my work or artifact, I, for me, I, the way, the way I was able to overcome this challenge uh, back then was really to uh, uh, be engaged in recording methods or recording my practice. Uh, to have this kind of a documentation, even though that back then I really didn't know what the documentation means. I didn't know how to look at them. And it was a really a radical uh, change um, and that involved lots of fear and concern because an artist who comes from the concept of object making all of a sudden uh, um, working so many hours in the studio in this practice that involved both uh, embodiment and movement and performance and marking, erasing, uh, or era rearranging. There's a, there was a lot of labor in it, but at the, at the end, there was nothing, not, I didn't have anything, nothing left other than what, what we can think if we think from, uh, you know, not a philosophical, but in phenomenological perspective, it's, it's inscribed within my own body, all these experiences. 
and 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 in the digital files as a fractures of, or traces. Um, back then, I wasn't able to think about land the way I'm able to think about it today. I I think I grew and evolved as human. I'm constantly changing, evolving, and growing and learning. Um, so uh, I wasn't able to really understand uh, how the idea of land or place and space, because I was really dealt with my own my own struggle as, a, as an artist, as a painter. Mm -hmm. um, but as I continued to work and as I continued to not work, but experiment, it was a completely experimental process uh, to into the unknown. But as I continue doing it and um, I realized that within these methods that I've been kind of developing, I'm actually engaged in some kind of a performative yeah, action to deliberately displace and dislocate my gestures, my work. So, uh, so the painted gestures are moving from the surface of the canvas and into the wall and from the wall into the camera or my body gestures, again, moving uh, from being an ephemeral gesture because we know uh, body gesture is ephemeral, it's evaporated the minute it has performed and it's, 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 it's temporary. But then uh, reconsidering its materiality in form of inscription that is inscribed within an image. So then I realized that I'm, I'm that the way I'm using these methods of, uh, and back then I called it I called it the, la the landing surface. I'm mm. I'm questioning the landing surface of the artifact. I'm questioning the surface in which the gesture is being inscribed, whether it's a body, whether it's it's a painted gesture. And at some point, I really was able to see how these methods really mirrored my experience as, 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 as a human being, my liminal subjectivity, my identity, the complex identity, and how I am dealing with negotiating different parts of myself, where I'm coming from, where I was born, where my parents were born, and where I'm coming, and, 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 um, and, and acknowledging it or realizing it, that I'm doing these methods that really um, resembling this world, it, it felt good. Mm -hmm. I, I, st I was still worried and I still had nothing, no artwork, but but it but but it felt um, authentic. Or it was kind of like a rendering thing, you know. When we do things, when as an artist, we have a dialogue with materials and. The materials speak to us. Mm. And sometimes it's a battlefield, and sometimes it's a love making. It's, um, and so it was kind of a, a dialogue that I can mm. almost like a get, received kind of response that make me feel like I'm going somewhere, even if it's still chaotic. And I'm, I'm kind of, and 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 back then I was really, really not. I wasn't even also part of a community. I was really working on it. I was a young mother. I was most of the time was kind of taking care of my children and the house and going to the studio and work. I wasn't involved the way I was involved. To, well, I'm involved today, but um, yeah. So what I wanted to say is that now I understand these methods. If I wanted to think about decolonizing painting or uh, de reconstructing materials. Uh, I would think about it, and maybe it's a metaphoric way to think about it or maybe poetic, but I, I think that for me, I was able to, to understand the, the landing surface, the land through these methodologies that I've been working with. Mm -hmm. Hmm. You want to tell us a little bit about this piece? Body notes. Um, yes, I can talk. Uh, this is um, it's called bo body notes. It's mm -hmm. a performance. So, yeah, movement through 
Ochre Horizon. Yeah. Yes, and it's also, uh, I wanted to mention that body note, it's not specifically a title. Mm. It's, not, it's not that this, uh, this is a particular work. I don't know if it is a work. I, I, um, it is a series of, of, of works that I've been working with back then. And when I um, use, use the digital camera in the studio, I was specifically interested in that breakage point, in that threshold. Um, that between two images and I was um, interested in um, really take the digital camera to the extreme so I was uh, I was making a setting on the camera of high shot like different shutter speed or light really challenging the camera the camera to be able to capture images because I wanted to have this kind of a breakage or I wanted to uh, I wanted to, to to break the image um, and but I was also in the, was interested in that sound, so the sound of the, the camera, the clicking of the camera. So the recording methods that I've been using back then, it was not a video, and it, it was specifically keyframe still photographs uh, that has been uh, made by uh, an extreme setting of, of a digital camera. So for example, if a digital camera, um, I'm set to take image every two seconds, every four seconds, and the setting is really, really challenging for the camera to calculate light and uh, movement and so on, you really hear the camera struggling, like really trying to figure out in every few, and that's something that I was interested. Uh, so this is a reconstruction of uh, performance keyframe still photographs that has been arranged in, a, in some kind of a, a syntax. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, there's painting in there. And the, what you see in the back is, again, the wall with a drawing, uh, very minimal drawing on the wall. And then there is uh, the, 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 the kind of orc line is really a mask and tape that was been oh. put on the <laughs> wall. Uh, again, this idea of materials became become something completely different to me. I was interested in what happened when it's repeating itself in this structure, um, and and uh, the inscription of the material, um, and um, yeah. So there's different ways to look at it. It could be first it looks like an abstraction, mm -hmm. but. Um, yeah, you've, it, that's interesting, right? You, in this new method, these, uh, taking these new methods, you really transition from figurative uh, compositions to, to the abstract, almost like you're resisting um, being framed or captured or documented. You know, there's a resistance to this that, um, I don't know, it's almost like you're fighting back against the lens or the gaze of the camera. It's uh, quite fascinating. It's, it was quite quite a paradox because I've been, you know, there's this idea of being an imminent artist or like, because I was functioning in different spaces, the space, the, the, the performance space, the studio space, uh, the camera space, uh, and the editing space. And so I am looking at the work from multiple perspectives. I'm seeing and being seen at the same time. Mm -hmm. uh, and when I'm performing in the studio, I no longer see myself because I, I embodied this, the movement of the camera and the, and the duration. So I'm moving accordingly and I don't see myself. I envision myself through the lens of the camera. And then I see the images. So the whole process of seeing and being seen and making subject, object was really such a volatile, uh, base and um and i guess maybe that speaks to this idea of abstraction or mm -hmm. organs of the body or body without organs or mm -hmm. <laughs> so in uh, when i read your bio it mentions how you were born in some rock in judea amazing is that how you say that yeah i see that you changed the structure of the question so i want to go back to yeah um, so how do you feel your family's history impacts the way you perceive, interact with, or represent land today as 
I know you weren't thinking about that back then, but are you thinking about land differently today? Um, I was born in Israel. My parents were born in Morocco in the mid fifties and um, left Morocco pretty much overnight mm. uh, and uh, uh, fled from Morocco to different uh, temporary camps in, um, in, uh, in, in Europe and eventually ended up uh, arriving to Israel. And I was born in a, in a small immigrant town in the south of Israel that was mostly occupied by North African immigrants. Um, and so even though I was growing up in Israel, I grew up in a very little Morocco. So it was mm -hmm. like, since, since childhood, I was living in this between these two cultures um, and uh, in which the culture of my parents, where they came from, it's, it's an Arabic culture. Um, and we all know that where I'm coming from, it's a very complex region. Um, and however, in many ways, the way my parents were able to create their own community was also in a different way. Uh, and then later on, I became an immigrant uh, to Canada. And um, I've always felt like I'm always in between places. Um, mm. And I think it was even more... Uh, difficult to me when I arrived uh, when I arrived to Canada back then again when I as, as I mentioned when I came here I um, I was kind of trying to figure out things for myself I think from today I'm able to kind of uh, look at it from a, a broader perspective in relation to where I'm now where I, where I live and, uh, and, each, and and other as a settler here in Canada um, so I'm gonna show this picture because I, um, it's called the diasporic gesture. And so I really thought that this this picture responded to that question as well. Do you wanna speak a little bit how this might, like I definitely see the in-between here that you just like feeling like you're always in between is, do you wanna to speak to that or? And I can continue talking about this question. Yeah. Talk about it is that, you know, the, the notion of place and space and land is really, really, really complex for me. It was always been part of my work and part of my practice in a different ways, but it was always a contemplation, it's always a negotiation. Um, and um, and it, it is, it is um, it comes into expression both within my practice, the materials, the, the, the space of my work, but it also relates to who I am and, and how I am, uh, how do I understand I have no land. I, I live here and I, in the, partly I don't belong here. I, I was born in Israel and I have, I, in many ways I don't see myself belong to Israel because I, I have, you know, uh, particular point of view about things and, and rights and politics and so on and and it's really really uh, difficult because it is the place of my childhood I was born there right so how you negotiate this uh, feeling belong but you don't belong in what way and um, later on in uh, back in 2018 I started this ethnographic research and after doing some interviews with my parents uh, who my mom never went back to where she was born. She left when she was 13 and she never returned back to, to Morocco and she never wanted to talk about it. Um, and, 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 and she didn't want to share her experiences or stories. It was almost as if it, everything was kind of blocked. And through interviews with her, I have traveled to Morocco and I... Uh, found her village and I found her home uh, which is basically was kind of a ruins in in a tiny Berber village in the Atlas Mountains um, and uh, which when I arrived there and I show her the space and her home through my phone it was quite a shocking that was kind of a residue of, of, of the past but that's really affected me as well because when I arrived to Morocco I um, it felt like I came to a place I've never been, but I know this place. Mm. 
Um, so that's how complex this idea of like land or, or, or belonging and and it was really really even 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 more complex after I returned from Morocco. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah, what you see here is um, is a performance still photograph uh, of a studio performance. Um, and again, this is just a fragment of, of a, a tea frame from a, a collection of, of images. Uh, you, you're, you are actually in this, aren't you? But it's very ghostly. It's like, I'm, I'm, that, I'm guessing I'm seeing you here in the sort of left-hand side in front of the blue um, blue door portal there. A am I right that we're seeing you moving there? Uh, there's a movement of body in there. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Body it's very, there. Yeah. There, is, there is a presence of 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 body in there in, in mm -hmm. the image. There's a there's a, a constellation of of inscriptions of of gestures uh, on on leaning on the wall is four or three long rectangle panels uh, mm -hmm. with kind of very simple maybe kind of a drawing like gestures that extend into the wall um, mm -hmm. and uh, kind of an arrangement of uh, these rectangles which are, are really a painting painting canvas frames so the can the frames yeah. of the canvas yeah. became the painting I started to paint the frames and 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 put them in space in the composition mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, you know, there are artists who are working the way you do and uh, much more conceptually and um, performatively. Um, so, but this often the stereotype of a successful artist is expected to maneuver and produce for the capitalist machine. <laughs> so what else needs to be unmade in order for artists to be able to resist producing and mass reproducing consumable goods. So what needs to basically be unmade so that artists can take up practices, um, you know, that are more ephemeral, um, where the process is the art. Um, and when I say producing and mass reproducing consumable goods, you know, I'm thinking about this huge wave of artists printing their images on bags and t-shirts and, uh, you know, which all requires more material, but we do this, we do this because we need ways to survive, um, you know, finding a way for not only our art to get out there, but just to be, for able, people to be able to afford something smaller than a, an original painting, artists are, are putting their works on uh, mass, mass produced objects. So have you thought about you know, how, what, what, after are you PhD, because you're doing a PhD, what, how, what needs to be unmade in order you to keep working this way so that it's sustainable, you know? I don't know, I'm, I'm kind of locked into the idea of stereotype of an artist or the majority of artists, and I think how can we even, um, think about the stereotype of an artist from this point in time. I mean, uh, there's such a, a variety, like such a inflation of, of, of uh, different kind of artistic practices today that, uh, and also I think, you know, I don't think uh, we can, me or anyone else can really judge how artists, um, make decisions about producing or materials. Um, I still enjoy seeing artists who are involved with practices that involve with drawing or painting. It, it brings me joy. And I guess what I'm thinking is it really is depend on perception or ideas that artists work with. Um, and and you also, you, you again, repeating this idea of unmade or un, unmaking, but I, with, with, in relation to materialities, or I, I think about remaking, I think about ideas of new materialism. I don't necessarily think that 
uh, we need to change the materials. As you can see with this process that I've been working with for almost six years, I kept working with painting and drawing and materials that are traditional materials. However, I was reconstructing these materials, having different kind of relationship with these materials, reorganizing them in a different way. So I am still involved with it, with, with, with these materials. So I think it is more about um, rethinking materialities in a different way, mm -hmm. as opposed to inventing all new, mater new materials or, um, I like this um, uh, idea that uh, Suzanne Cousel, she's a scholar and she's, she's writing a lot about um, uh, new materialism and visual materialities in relation to the digital and the and painting and she uh, wrote a beautiful article it's called crafting a new viscosity and she's talking about from this point in time in which materials whether it's the painting or drawing or ph photography or dance or music or choreography are no longer are within their own media specificity or with their own but the, but rather artists today um, recombining, reorganizing, taking materials. And I guess the work of an artist is to find way to, to bring to how things bound to one another, how these materials around certain context. So for me also to think about materialities, I was thinking about materialities of gestures. So for me, to deal with this idea of materialism or object making or artifact, I went into really the, this idea of like material materialities of gesture in terms of if they're temporal, if they're ephemeral, if they're tangible. Um, and that really helped me to uh, figure out the materialities for myself. So I rematerialized the gestures in a certain way. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I think I'm, this question's coming from, you know, the, a, a lot of people will walk downtown Toronto in the summer and see the Toronto Art Fair, and th this is their, you know, only exposure to art, is sort of seeing these outdoor art fairs and sort of this, uh, um, so that is their understanding of what artists do, right? And, and there's a sort of an expectation that, um, that that should be sustainable <laughs> and we we know it's not we move in and out of these moments where it's uh you know not even doable never mind sustainable so, yeah so back then when i was trying to figure out for myself when i kind of deviated from painting i really had to figure out for myself i still had to make a living you know i had mm -hmm. bills to pay and so i had to sustain myself and I decided to do other things. I was teaching, tutoring, cooking, doing different kinds of things. And uh, to be able to do this crazy, weird, ambiguous practice that I didn't know it felt right to me, but it was also a process of healing. I had to go through this because I had to figure out things for myself, but I had no money. So what I'm saying is that uh, it helped me to detach my decision making, like mm. not to be affected by uh, outside uh, forces when I make decisions of the work. Yeah. And so I kind of detach this. If, if artists work within, you know, make a living only from making artwork, I think it's really, really challenging. So yeah. I don't see, I, I don't have these contemplations today anymore. I. <laughs> work I would do anything I need to do uh, to to make a living and uh, um, will try as much as I can to um, of course I'm, I'm also collaborating I'm engaged a lot with collaborative processes because because my the, the interdisciplinary work that I'm doing involved in collaborative effort so there's a different ways of working and I think also uh, back then, when I met you, compared to today, there is more um, uh, movement toward uh, community-based project, mm -hmm. community work, um, collectives, and um, different kind of 
uh, uh, spaces that um, not involved really commercial aspect of it. Yeah. I loved, I loved the uh, minimalist uh, composition of this one. <laughs> so. <laughs> so there's, a, I don't know, there's, well, I don't know. I, I think there's a whimsy to it, but at the same time, there's a haunting whimsy to it. Like there's, there's an absence there that's. Um, so yeah. I think by now you will already notice that we're looking on the same wall that is co co constantly changing. Yes. And so that gives kind of a perspective or really glimpse into the process of um, painting, drawing, recording, erasing, painting, yeah. drawing, recording, erasing, painting, drawing, recording, erasing over and over again for many, year, many years. And yeah, so even though you're know, using paint, you're not uh, consuming, oh, consuming more substrates per se. You're sort of using found objects and uh, existing objects to cover over, or we were talking about palimpsest. So that's the qu next question I had. Um, so can you provide us a little insight into how um, this palimpsest nature of your performative work materially reflects your conceptual investigations and what is being unmade through their creation? And it's, in, you know, you could also see be remade or uh, or reborn or something. I, I, I find every time you erase it, it's preparing it for something new, which is really, um, yeah. Maybe you, want, you would like to share the um, sure. uh, moving image and I can talk about it uh, as it's running around. I created this video and it's a four minutes video of uh, that comprise uh, images uh, studio photo documentation uh, that's been over around like five, six years in which I'm documenting this wall that I'm painting on it. And uh, it really, this really emphasizes this idea of palimpsest, notion of palimpsest. And, um, but before I'm going to talk about palimpsest, I'm going to talk about performative because you mentioned performative. And I think this is very, very important because um, when I talk about performativity, uh, we all know we, we can talk about from uh, from uh, Butler and so many other scholars are talking about performativity and performativity in gender and performativity in identity construction, and 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 it's important for me to mention that it's about a performative action. It's not necessarily a life performance or performance. It's a, and and also to remember that even the most traditional artists who work with traditional practices are engaged with performative actions. Even the artist, the painter, uh, who's in the solitude of their own studio, that action of they do whatever they do, no one see it in the gallery space. No one see, no one see that performative gesture, but it's, it's, it is performative in a way. So um, it's important to mention it, to mention that. So yeah, what you're seeing here is uh, uh, the images of, of the wall over time, um, and uh, <laughs> I love the dogs in there. <laughs> and when we talk, we talk about we're talking about palimpsest. We, of course, we're talking about erasure, and in the in the strict sense of palimpsest, we, it's about uh, the idea of script that has been erased over time, and and also in 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 a miraculous way, we are talking about. In the in, in the in the in the origin of this idea of palimpsest is being written on skin, right? Um, and so palimpsest is the idea of erasures, erasures um, uh, um, of over script. But um, what I'm thinking about is, you know, and it's what if we can think about palimpsest. As, as a body, a palimpsest body, is to think about our bodies as a, as a palimpsest. Um, mm. When we think about erasures uh, uh, in, 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 the, in the original or in the strict sense of a palimpsest, we're talking about residues or marks that comes above the surface from something that has been done before and long forgotten, but there's always a bruise 
always a mark, always something that comes into the surface, force itself into the su surface. Uh, all these ideas of palimpsests are very similar to what to to, to ideas of uh, to 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 think to um, inscriptions of trauma or that is inscribed within our body, uh, and mm -hmm. that comes above the surface. So I really like to think about the idea of palimpsest not only from uh, from the perspective of of the painting itself that you know. This, what you're looking at is a life-size palimpsest, um, but um, to, to think about, about the body that inscribed the gestures, the inward inscription of gestures over time, um, that we don't, we don't see it, but it's, it's always there. Um, and um, so this wall that you see, this wall is a, is a, is a space, is an archive, Mm -hmm. The wall that archived the gestures over time. Um, yeah. And it, it's, you know, we don't necessarily, here's another example, sort of a, um, these are stills, but, you know, it, it gives an example of how much, uh, e e even your, one gesture is overwriting another gesture as part of these stills, which is, so your body does embody this sort of overwriting or um, it's a, like it's almost, you know, erasing its last movement or gesture, which is interesting. Again, it's rematerializing or re reconstructing gestures in a way that, you know, these movement, what, what, what are we looking at right now? We're looking at images, uh, but the experience is not there. It's not the real thing. It's mm -hmm. a trace of experience that, I felt it. It is within me. This is what we're looking at. Is not a, an artwork. It's a documentation. Mm. It's a, it's a construction of still photographs, but it is a documentation. And it's also important to mention that for many years I didn't, wasn't even even a, able even to look at these materials or even to think about them as an artwork or really to figure out how to what kind of a presentation or what kind of which ways I can bring it into the gallery. And, and when mm. I started to, and when I, and when there was, there was a possibility for me to bring the work into a gallery space, um, I've always been told that I need to figure out, to pull out uh, this image, this is a good image, and this is a good image, and let's, let's print it and put it in. But and that's, do it this way was an artwork, but it was really, really challenging for me because I really, felt that experience as a whole you know we think about the gestalt you know yeah it's the sum of the, it, it's the whole experience that is the experience is um and uh and so the painted gestures are no longer there but they are be, became a monument within the within the picture uh, um and they bec they have movement there is a different kind of movement also this idea of when we talk about materialities, for me, it's about motion and motion become material, light become, became, become material. Um, and working with 2D space or with traditional painting, I was kind of also wanted to have this experience of movement and uh, the ability to integrate somatic practice and movement practice, because I, I do have a background as a dancer. Okay. So, um, that makes a lot of sense. <laughs> to yeah bring, to, to contemplate body gesture paint gesture and again constantly migrating them from one space to another mm. so we are looking at a photograph of a moment uh inscription uh, but it or, or 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 document this is a document but it's not it's not an artwork but but again but i think um as a result of this struggle of really this, trying to figure out where is my work, I was able to later on to go to, that's what prompted me to go to do my master and my master thesis was um, uh, focused on the interrelations between performance of documentation and I've been delving deep down into the ontological debate of of lifeness and presence in documentation and what it means when we reconstruct materials, what it mean when we, means when we bring 
archive from the past into the present moment. What is the work? Uh, Andre Lepecki, Peggy Fellen, Rebecca Schneider, um, all this. Um, and so, and it helped me to be able to uh, really understand these materials and later on to be able to find way to integrate them in, in, in our work. Okay, I think, uh, okay, so you've been talking about materials, materiality of gesture, um, but we haven't really talked about materiality of your technology because you're using a lot of technology to record and archive your practice. Um, and technology sort of been in, you know, forefront of debate in terms of um, material and this, you know, this perception that it isn't a lot of material. So I just wonder if you think that there is a need to unmake ourselves from different forms of technology for our own well-being, well as well as the planet, just because we're learning about how much, you know, mining needs to happen for our technologies. And now all of the NFTs and all, all of that stuff that's uh, an energy that's used to store these archives. Have, has anybody asked you about that or, or have you thought about that at all? I, I don't see the word materialities, but I think it's really complex to mention materials within the, the digital. I also don't see the difference that much. I... I don't think it's impossible to, I, I also don't know if unmaking is the right way to say, to, to say that I don't think it's impossible to unmake ourselves from uh, digital technology, regardless artistic practices, just in the general, uh, you know, it, our flesh, our self. Marla Ponty talk, wrote, wrote, you know, the idea of the flesh and the idea of the chisel. Is, is no longer within our just physical body, it's it's digital body and everything that happens in between. And um, we are also engaged with technology in the way that we're not even aware of it. And it's also mm -hmm. the embodiment. Um, and so I, I, I don't have these contemplations, I, uh, whether we are too much working with technology, uh, there is a reason to do things in a certain way, but uh, I think that it's so intertwined um, in a way that <clears throat> that it's, ne it's nearly impossible. You know, I'm having a conversation with you right now, and you ask mm -hmm. me a question, and I'm responding, and there's some kind of some kind of affect happening between us, and I feel you, and it's almost as if there's nothing happened between us. Um, as, and it's, it's always as you are, you are here. Like I am really, I feel your the, your pre, pre, presence here. And so we don't think about like, what is it between you and I right now is not real. Right. It, this is not real, but we are uh, expressing feelings and emotions and talking and, and it's happening. And sometimes we don't really realize. And so um, within my practice, I work with technology, I work with AR, I work with VR, I experiment with different kind of performative experiments with technology. I'm interested to learn embodiment within technology. I'm interested mm. in themes of movement. I'm interested about it from the creative space, right? To experimentation and to make artwork. Or, um, and this is wonderful, but at the same time, I'm always, there's always on the side, the, the, the kind of space between uh, aesthetic and ethic. Um, so aesthetically, I'm interested in how can I feel that kind of sacredness or movement or these kind of affects and emotions when I'm interacting with technology, how can I use technology to bring it into installation space uh, that brings archive and kind of create kind of experience for audience. Uh, through archive that comes from the past, but through these temporalities and responsive technologies, I can uh, uh, create experience. All this is wonderful, but however, there's also responsibility. Uh, uh, if we understand that these these things are happening, it means that it's it, it, it's it's also related to censorship and author and and, and um, surveillance. You know, it's a it's a multi billion dollar industry that make money out of reading your movement uh, with technology. Mm. Um, 
And it, it's so subtle, it's so subtle that we're not even aware of it, that every movement is being read and rendering back to us. So, so what it means. And, and so there's those two sides. And as an artist, we try to navigate. So I, I, that's what I'm thinking about technology. I don't think it's unmaking because even if you are de detaching yourself from technology, it, it's, it takes only 15 minutes for you to be engaged, let's say in social media, to be able to be affected but what yes. you're seeing, and these affecting the way you're responding to the world. And, and so that, that, that contagiancy, you know, it's the cybernetics, it's like choreography of agency, it's, I would call it, that we, we, don't, we, we can detach ourselves, we need to figure out. And I wanted to talk about creative practice and artistic practices because, um, you know, I'm, right now I'm teaching at York University, uh, of course it's called, um, arts fundamentals and the student go through different dimensions and they practice from 2D, 3D, 4D, and they learn about space and, and, the, and, and, and the experiment with different uh, studio area. What I wanted to say is that even uh, traditional practices in a way involved with some kind of a technology. So mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's happening both, uh, but, but we don't need to neglect technology or neglect traditional practices. These traditional practices are very, very important. That is, we have this idea of techne, Heidegger, right? Mm -hmm. It's a work in between. It's in between the craft, the materials and, in, and the technological. So it's, it's this kind of, uh, and for me, I work with technology because of all these things that I mentioned as well as I'm interested to, to, to see, to, 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 to explore what's the role of new technologies in archival art practices. Yeah. How artists adopt uh, documentation methods to record their work. How important is documentation in creative practice? Um, these, these are the things that I'm interested about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, well, I've been using stop motion video and, you know, one of, one of the things I've just uh, noted to myself is uh, it speeds up our process, right? It doesn't really truly reflect the labor <laughs> um, that goes into the creative practice and um, sort of undermines undermines the knowledge labor skill because it sort of skips over so much. And so I've just been thinking about how you know video or stop motion photography. We, we use it to get people's attention and to show or, or create a fact. And yet uh, we're sort of undermining ourselves at the same time because it's this accelerated aesthetic. Um, uh, we're putting out an accelerated aesthetic. So those are, those are just things I've been thinking about. We're, we're kind of running out of time. Um, and I wanted, I just, is there anybody else uh, so are there any other women artists out there who you're looking at who are inspire your practice uh, or who you feel are doing some interesting work to sort of disrupt, um, um, you know, what we've been speaking about? Yeah, but um, I wanted to go back to what you mentioned now is that, you know, I don't see the work as an artwork. It's I my practice yeah. involved iterative process it's an endless repetition and my work is not a linear process of producing I'm constantly going backward and for forward my work is uh, is an open work it's it's a, mm -hmm. it's a, it's it has an open-ended work and is a constant way of becoming it's not necessarily this body of work or this work or this work my work is an idea I don't know what the materials and in which the materials that I'm producing in my work, whether it's a drawing, a photograph, a picture, a moving image, uh, these are materials of a, that idea. So they're subjected to different kind of modulations. So I have the authority and the liberty to um, use these materials in a different way even knowing that it's, this is very problematic because it's problematizing the notion of the identity of my artwork itself. Mm. And that is the essence of my practice. And that is also the biggest struggle as an artist because I don't have body work, but, but it's important to mention it. So everything is uh, materials, it's, it's an idea. It's ideas that are constantly uh, revisited. That's, mm -hmm. that's this is the artwork. Um, 
I don't know about, uh, I mean, I, I feel like lately I'm very curious about curatorial practices, not necessarily because I'm in interested to practice uh, um, curation, but I'm really, really intrigued by how curators are uh, working around certain subject or urgencies and how over time their, their engagement with these urgencies um, develop different kind of uh, uh, bodies of work that brings different kind of artists. That's always, I'm always fascinated to see curators that really engage with ideas of indigenous land, um, uh, gender, racism, blackness, uh, and the way they are um, in, uh, really bringing into the fourth practices that we might not have the chance to, to see and to look. And so I think that's really, that's what I think about uh, um, more, more than curatorial journeys than, than artists. But I wanted to mention if there is any one artist is Susie Lake. Susie Lake. Okay, uh, yes. She's a, she's a dear friend. And um, uh, back then in 2017, when I was quite lost and uh, not sure what's happening, uh, someone introduced us and um, and since then she was a, uh, she, she's a huge mentor and she's a huge inspiration and influence and uh, um, meeting her at that point in my life, not, not even able to talk about art and being embraced by her and ha having her telling me that this is good, this is good. So Susie really gave me the permission to do what I'm doing today. Yeah. And, uh, and, um, and I think uh, uh, she was also helping me to be able to find a way to look at the materials. And then in 2019, I had the first exhibition, it's called Choreographed Mark at the Varley Art Gallery. And this, this installation, this body of work I was working with, with Susie, that was helping me to find my way of looking into my photographs and archives. And uh, I'm really, really grateful to her. Mm -hmm. I can definitely, now that you say that, I can definitely see how she would be an inspiration to you. Absolutely. And she's really wonderful, wonderful and funny and wonderful human being. So you've mentioned a few names throughout the interview. I'm wondering if you can even just revisit those for us so we can jot those down. Um, is there any books, essays, yeah. blogs? Yeah. So I, um, I, I mentioned... Um, new materialism and I really think you know uh, uh, Elizabeth Gross wrote a lot about this idea of new materialism uh Suzanne Cousel also materialities within the artwork and can you course, I'm sorry can you spell Suzanne's last name k-o-z-e-l okay and of course when we think about painting we think about Maurice Marlowe Ponty I've always been leaning toward his writing uh the eye of the spirit um uh um there's so many. Uh, mm -hmm. Marlo Ponti's, uh, these specifically uh, uh, when we think about painting and perception and, and flesh. Um, right now, I'm completely, completely, completely immersed by the book uh, no, that by Juliet Singh. It's No Archive Will Restore You. Uh, it's so, so moving, so, so beautiful and meaningful. And um, and we talked a lot about gestures and uh, the book Migration of Gesture by Sally Ann and Carrie Nolan is just a, a wonderful book. It's a collection of nine essays uh, that really uh, speak about gestures from completely different perspectives and disciplines. And um, it, it, this book, uh, I keep coming back to it. It was really, really important book for me and still that, uh, about about gestures and materials, specifically mm. now that I'm thinking about the diasporic gesture. It's just really wonderful uh, book about uh, how gestures migrate from body to body, how gestures migrate from uh, um, different languages, from sign systems, from, from, from drawing to music, from movement to sketches, from um, really beautiful, beautiful book. Um, mm. And uh, yeah. Interesting. Thank you. This will be recorded. So if people missed any of that, we'll have an archive of your listing. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Martine, um, for being here. And Claire's here. And yes. 
Okay, well, that was great. Uh, thank you very much. I'm going to, uh, I, again, Nava, thank you so much for doing this interview. Uh, and thanks again to the McLaren Art Center for sponsoring the Zoom call.